that I have. I actually like this one, the softer leather. It's it's just a nicer mm -hmm. holding Bible for me. And uh, so, anyways, I went back to it. Turn me again to the second book of Peter. Second Peter, we're in the first chapter. And we'll begin with verse 2. 2 Peter, chapter 1, verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge and, uh, and of... We try reading that again. <laughs> Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain to unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in this world through lust, and beside this, give all diligence, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you, and abound, they shall make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind, and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sin. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, again we thank you and rejoice that we have the privilege to stand and to come before you in the word of God and to have you teach us those things that, that are found in thy word. And Father, I ask that you will impress upon us and, and enlighten us concerning the truths that are found in this passage of Scripture, that Christ may, might be glorified and magnified in us, in our daily living, that we will show that, that we are truly, truly the children of God, and that it should be manifested unto others by the way that we live, the actions that we take, the things that we speak, that we might manifest Christ in us, the hope of glory. We thank you for thy word. Bless it to us. Strengthen us with it. Encourage us by it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Over the last couple of weeks, it's, we're, we're into our third week on this passage of Scripture. Amen. And last week, we looked at uh, four things. And, and, and first of all, let me back up just a little bit, where it says, add to your faith. Now, the word there, add, does not mean the addition of one plus one plus one plus one. First we do one, and then we add in a second, then we add in a third, then we add in a fourth, and there are seven virtues that are listed here. So we aren't talking about just one thing at a time. But rather, when we were saved, the, the word here, the, this, is, this is teaching us that, that basically what happened when we were saved, we got all of these. And what we now need to do is we need to organize them, if you pardon the term, and make them all work together. And it would be, the, it is used in the term of like somebody who is, who is a conductor of an orchestra, or perhaps a choir director would be another way of putting it, where he has all of the members before him, uh, and, uh, since I'm really familiar with choirs, probably a little bit more than I am about uh, directors of orchestras, I know that you usually have four, possibly five. You've got your sopranos, unless you've got a big choir, but your basic church choir has sopranos, altos, tenors, and bass, and you might even have a baritone or two to stick in there. Nevertheless, you have all of these people, and they can all sing, or maybe they can't. I mean, even they're volunteer <laughs> choirs, you, you're never <laughs> quite sure what you're going to get sometimes. And so the choir director's job is to take all of these voices and to maybe instruct them, in how to read music, to understand the director and the directions, to understand what it means to, to increase in volume and decrease in volume and get soft and get loud, all of these, these things that, that 
are included in, in a choir. And then it's getting the voices, everybody to sing their correct note, because the sopranos don't sing the tenor notes. And the tenors aren't supposed to sing the alto notes, so we all have our specific notes that we're supposed to sing that are on the page. And so we need to make sure that we get all those voices synced up. And the whole idea is that when you are done, and your choir is performing or singing, that they sound like one voice. They, so that they all blend together. And so what comes out almost sounds, they're singing in, in unis or chorus together. They are singing together as one voice with all of their distinct parts so that we are blessed by the sound of that music. Now I have seen choirs perform and people sing and you're going, oh my, oh my, that's, <laughs> that, that, that's a little hard. <laughs> There's nothing like a, like a piano. Uh, I've seen choirs where they're supposed to start off or that during the, oh, I, I remember one where we're singing along, and then there was a spot in the middle of that song that was a cappella, and then you moved into the a cappella section, and then when the music picked up again, we were all flat. <laughs> that was really impressive. <laughs> so th that's what we have here. We have all these seven virtues that are listed here, and we are to bring them in alongside of each other. Bring them in side by side. That's what the word means there where it says uh, to add to your faith. And it means to bring all in alongside so that all of these are working together and they all work. They, you bring them in side by side, but they all work together. They all dovetail together. You really can't have one in its fullness without having the other. And, and one is, is standalone. doesn't work without something else over here. So they all must correspond and work together. And we saw last week that we were supposed to be, that we were supposed to first supply moral virtue. And by that we talked about, uh, and the word there, moral, it means moral excellence or manliness or strenuousness or inner energy, full of uh, being energetic. And that was what the word virtue meant. And it was in reference to our faith that we are to be manly in our faith. We are to be virtuous, yes, by all means. But here's the thing. We're talking about spiritual things here. Now, there are men in this life who, without the, without the presence of the Holy Spirit, can be virtuous and are virtuous. There are some. There are people in this world, believe it or not, who are very morally upright as, as they're concerned. But remember, we're talking about a spiritual gift that God has given so it is not what mere more mortal man can attain to, but rather this is a spiritual thing. And we're talking about strength, um, uh, which comes from our, our, our manliness in our faith, an ability to stand up for our faith, a holy boldness to profess our faith in Jesus Christ. It is the courage to fight the good fight of faith. That's what it is. And so uh, we're to be we have, are to have this virtue of faith. And then we see that we're supposed to supply or bring alongside knowledge. We noted that this knowledge was not the knowledge of Christ because we have that, because we are in Christ. We have faith, so we have knowledge of Christ. But rather, this is a knowledge of the will of God for our lives, for us. And the way we, we attain that is through the Scripture. Now, this isn't something where you're praying along and say, God, show me what I need to do. If we're obedient to the Word of God, and we're instructed in the things of God, and we're working in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, if the Lord has a special calling for you, He will make you aware of it, and He will put you in that ministry, whatever it may be. If God has called you to be a preacher in a foreign land, to preach the gospel, to start a church, then what, I'm, what he'll do is he'll call you out of the work that you are presently doing in his church, then he'll call you out and give you a heart and a burden to go somewhere else. You don't have to say, a lot of people say, pray out, Lord, I, I know you want me to be a preacher, where do you want me to go? I'll tell you where you go. You go to, an, and you go to work in the Lord's church, and you start working in one of the Lord's church, 
and ministering among the brethren, and then God will bring to you where he wants you to go, if he wants you to go anywhere. There's a lot of people on mission fields that shouldn't go. Then I've known some men who have been, who've been working and in, 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 in trying to go to a field who later as they got through their working on their deputation realized, you know, really, God didn't call me to do that. He really called me to stay at home. Well, I'll tell you what, a lot of energy and a lot of time <coughs> and a lot of money was wasted because he was not sure of God's calling. You stay home and you work in the Lord's church until he directs you and points you to go somewhere else. And then you're free to go. So it was, a, it was dealing with an intelligent application. We also looked at it as being an intelligent application of what the will of God is in every detail. In other words, we know, and I use this as an example, we know that baptism is the Lord's will. We are clearly taught that in the in the New Testament that we are to. He says, "He that is he that believes and is baptized shall be saved." Now we. I, you need to understand it's not saying that baptism make is par a part of believing and baptism one you add this to this and then you're saved. It's not saying that you have to be baptized to be saved. You must understand that. Amen. But it is the evidence of your salvation and your obedience to Christ and it is towards your deliverance. Amen. Now the baptism does deliver and it delivers you in your conscience. Now, that, that's another subject. I, I, I don't want to go down that road. We'll, we'll try to stay on task here. But I'll try to finish the sermon today. I'm not <laughs> sure if I'll get there or not. <laughs> I'm going to take a little check on my watch to see where I am. Anyways, so what, you, what one does is he says, Okay, the Lord says that I'm supposed to be baptized. He that believeth and is baptized. So oh, I believe, I trusted Christ as my Savior. Now I need to be baptized. Well then, who should baptize me? Right? You should ask that question. And then where does he get the authority to baptize? You should ask that question. And then if, it's, if the authority comes to the church, how did that church get the authority to baptize? And then what is the means? Is, uh, uh, what is the reason why you are baptized? You need to consider that. Because the Bible tells us these things. It really, it really does. Not only that, but then how is there too? Now, are we supposed to have water thrown in our face or poured over our head? Are we supposed to be submerged under the water? Now, that's told us too. So the who, what, why, when, the details, we need to follow the details in order to be obedient to the Lord. Amen. Now, I've got a... <clears throat> I've got some legal pieces of paper back in, the, back in my office. Now, if the person who signed that legal per that paper, e everything's right, it looks right, I mean, all the details there, the wording's correct, it's got the official stamp on it, but if the person who signed it didn't have the authority to do so, how good is that legal document? It isn't any good at all. So we can go through, same thing with baptism. If we go through all and do everything right, but there's one thing wrong... Does it not invalidate the whole baptism? That's why I say an intelligent application of the will of God in each detail of practice. So when we want to be, if we're going to be, if we're to supply knowledge and concerning the will of God, all these things need to be considered. We can talk about the Lord's Supper. We can talk about how the polity of a church. It needs to follow the rules. The, uh, uh, of engagement, if you will, or the, the the law put down for us in the New Testament. It tells us how we're to do things. And if we do things wrongly, you can well, does not the Scripture say in Timothy that, that um, let's see if I can get it right here, if you strive, unless you strive lawfully, you'll not be crowned. So if you want the reward, then we need to do it according to to the dictates of New Testament rule, our Constitution, if you will, which is the New Testament. Then we also looked at temperance last week and the importance of temperance. We know that knowledge puffeth puff up. Now, when we consider temperance, we must remember that this temperance is not necessarily in relation to moderation only. 
In other words, well, never, you know, my, my mom or my, my, I think it was you or my dad used to always say, never be sharp, never be flat, always be natural. Somewhere in the middle, right? We, we know that drinking is never to be ex to excess, is it? Is to be our eating is not to be an excess. Anything that we do is not to be an excess. It's supposed to be moderated. But yet we have weak and ignorant brethren. So this temperance may mean more than just that. It may mean abstinence altogether, so that we don't cause any offense to any of the brethren. We 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 our moderation has to do with control and discipline. Give no offense to the church to the to the Jew nor to the Gentile, nor to the Church of God, the Scripture says. So, uh, whatever we do, we must be sure to guard ourselves and to be temperate in all that we do so that we do not cause those offenses, so that we do not offend weaker and ignorant brethren. And if, it's, and if you're free to do it and you desire to do it, do it in private. Do it alone. <laughs> So that you take no, uh, so that you give no occasion for offense. So we talked about supplying temperance. Then we talked about patience, and that's the ability to endure, to endure hardship as a good soldier. It has to do with with uh, uh, endurance. And, and, and like I said last week, we are like water. We choose. We generally choose to take the path of least resistance, right? I, that's a common human nature thing. Let's go the easier way. However, that's not so with being patient. We're to endure hardship, and, and we're to endure difficulties and persecutions and tribulations. We're to endure that, to remain under the pressure. That's what the word patience means, to remain under the pressure. And so there's much pressure that we endure. Now last week, let's see, and we got as far as um, I believe we're at godliness now. Mm -hmm. Godliness. Supply godliness. Now, in 1 Timothy, let's see, I've got some notes off the side here. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. First Timothy 4, 7 and 8 says, but refuse profane and old wives' fables. And exercise thyself, rather, unto godliness. For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having, the, having promise of the life that now is, or is now, or now is, and that which is to come. So godliness is profitable in this life, and it is profitable in the next life, isn't it? Now, one of the things I want you to notice is that, first of all, godliness is exercise. There is an exercising of godliness. My fine shape... Oh, maybe I shouldn't be... I'm not a very good example of my fine shape, am I? <laughs> You've, you've seen muscle builders, right? <laughs> and they got those big bulging biceps and triceps and pectorials and legs. I mean, they're strong. But how do they do that? By exercising, right? Pumping iron. Call that pumping iron. By running, exercising, doing all those things. And that's that's good for your body, too, as long as you don't go to excess. I mean, there's there's sometimes there's, there's problems when you go to excess. But nevertheless, bodily exercise does profit us, does it not? But godliness is far better than, than pumping iron. But nevertheless, godliness has to be exercised. We, we need to be careful about the things that we do, the things that we say. We need to exercise. It's part of that. We talked about discipline and temperance, right? A bodybuilder does not sit down and eat and gorge on on. on tons of carbohydrates, and that's all he eats. He narrows down to proteins and vegetables and things of that nature. Now, he needs some carbohydrates, yes, but nevertheless, those proteins are really important in the building of the muscle. So he has a diet that he disciplines himself to for his bodybuilding program. So we also have to take our diet appropriately in order to exercise.
exercise us towards godliness. And now I can't think of a better exercise than exercising ourselves in the Word of God, in prayer, in thanksgiving, in praise. Those are the things that are profitable for godliness. And so those are those are things that we must do. There must be the renewing of our mind as we meditate on spiritual and godly things. It is and it is and doing those things translates into an action of obedience according to the knowledge we find that we exercise godliness in the choices of the things that we do and make. In other words, we make proper choices guided by the things that we've learned in God's Word. How do you know what to do? When we talk about knowing the will of God, how are you going to know what to do, what direction to take, and how to exercise yourself if you do not saturate yourself with the Word of God? We have very little saturation of the Word of God these days. In fact, we see very little of the Word of God in most people's lives. You know, we busy ourselves with, with a ton of things. There's lots of things that we can do. And we choose to do everything else rather than sit down and read our Bible. How many families or how many people actually sit down in the evening and sit down and open up their Bible and read it? No. The entertainment system is working, isn't it? They're either on their phones or they're watching a movie or they're on their computers or something like that. That's easier to do than to exercise ourselves in godliness and to study God's Word. Another word for the word godliness is piety. Piety, it comes from, uh, it means right reverence or worship, which comes from this basic word, worth-ship. Someone who is worth reverencing. And reverence, um, the reverence that is paid to worth or worthiness. And Christ Jesus is the most, most worthy person that we could offer up any reverence to. And so in our piety, in our walk, it is, the, it is a form of giving reverence to God the Son. Now, are we not to be the image of Christ? And when people see us, are they not to, to see Christ? Are we not to be the sons of God in our daily walk in this world? If we are to do that, then we should be supplied with godliness or piety, showing the one of whom we reverence. And so we're to supply godliness or reverence. Now, over in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9, 9 and 10, it says this. In like manner also, the women, or that women, adorn themselves in modest apparel. I'll tell you, today women are apparel in a most immodest manner, in most cases. But with modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broidered hair of, or gold or pearls or costly array, but with but which becometh a woman professing godliness with good works. So how is a woman to adorn herself? She's to, or, or, uh, to uh, adorn herself with modest apparel. She's not to take... and Now, the reference here is that the, that the Romans often braided their hair and in the braiding or in the adorning of the hair and the putting up the hair, they put, put gold lace and pearls and things like that in there. And of course, they painted up their face to 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 show their their uh, position in society, how good they were. And, and but the word of God says that's not for godly women. A godly woman is to just adorn herself in modest apparel, not the not the put. Not to color her hair and streak it all out and and put things in it that to to draw attention to her hair and and she's not supposed to make her her face full of makeup. I don't mind a little bit of makeup, but I'll tell you what. Uh, we were in the store yesterday, and a gal was there to try to help me, and her eyebrows. And my eyes went right to her eyebrows because. She didn't really have much in the way of eyebrows, but she sure painted them on. It was not natural, and it was dark across here to make her make her look like she had eyebrows. 
And I couldn't get my eyes off it. It's just distracting. A woman professing godliness doesn't need all of that. Shamefacedness means a naturalness. Not that she's ashamed of her face, but there's a naturalness about her beauty. She's to have a natural beauty. Natural. When you put stuff all over your face, that's hardly natural, is it? So a natural beauty. Sobriety talks about her attitude. Now, and then it says there, uh, but, but how is a woman to adorn herself? Which becomes a woman professing godliness or piety? It is with good works. Isn't that what it says? But, take the parentheses out, but with good works. But, which becometh woman professing godliness with good works. For it is our, it, our the adornment and our beauty is our good works. Ladies, it's your good works. Being good wives and, 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 and being good, good women and upright and upstanding and moral and having all these virtues. That, are, that go along with a virtuous woman. We go over to Proverbs 31, we can learn more about the virtuous woman. But it is a woman who is noted for her good works. Professing godliness, piety. Men and women, as God's children, are to be filled with piety and uprightness. So not only do we supply godliness, this is a supply brotherly kindness. Now we know that we're to love the brethren. We know that that is a test of fellowship in the Word of God. John tells us that it's a test of fellowship. But notice that the word for bro the, the word for brotherly kindness here is the word Philadelphia. It is the word Philadelphia, or brotherly kindness, or brotherly love. We have a city here in the United States called Philadelphia, which is supposed to mean the city of brotherly love. We won't talk about the real condition of that city. It has nothing to do with love. But it is a manifestation of, of our kindness, our profession, our worship, our godliness. Would, without that, we would be hypocritical and it would be a mockery. We're to be, have brotherly kindness to everyone, not just to a unique few. Now, to be really honest, um, which I always try to be, I should say to be frank, since we should never say to be honest. Because that should be everything Everything we should do. We should do in all honesty. But sometimes we, we misuse that term. To be frank with you, <laughs> I, have, I failed in this. The, just yesterday, I was short with, with, the, with someone who was trying to help me at the store. And I became very short with her. And, 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 and downright testy, if you, if you mind. Um, she was only trying to help, but, but I really didn't need her help. <laughs> I, I really did and, and she says well I can order this on and I said if I wanted to order it online I could have done it at home I came down here to buy it well you know uh, <laughs> when I sat down there and actually analyzed it you know it was all about me it was just about me I wanted it, I wanted it now I went down to the store to expect to buy it well, it did, the store did not meet my expectations. It was about me. I wasn't very kind. I didn't demonstrate brotherly kindness. I didn't demonstrate because I was so self-centered. I didn't... She didn't know. She had no idea. She doesn't know my computer skills or anything else. And she was offering to order it on, for me. But, you know... See, it's a good thing it didn't happen because it would have been the wrong one. Because <laughs> when I went down there and I started studying, I found out that the part that I wanted to buy was not for a Windows 10 product. <laughs> and it may not have been compatible. And it may not have worked. So, you have to be careful about your attitudes. We need to show brotherly kindness to all men. See, brotherly kindness is the evidence of regeneration. It is the evidence of godliness, and it would be hypocritical and a mockery. Brotherly kindness is the truth of real godliness. If we are really godly people, it is, it is also beauty and comfort and security in a gospel church. 
It is the power of real godliness. It's in our kindness to one another. We need to be kind to one another. Let's look at some verses. We need to be kind to all men. That's, uh, and, and, and this is a spiritual thing. We can't naturally show kindness and brotherly love to all men. It's not a natural thing. It is a spiritual thing that we're given of, the, of God to do God good to them who do not do good to us. Let's go over to Matthew chapter 5 for just a moment. This is the Sermon on the Mount. And early in the Sermon on the Mount, he says this. This includes 5, 6, and 7. But in Matthew chapter 5, beginning with verse 43, look what it says. You have heard that it has been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. Well, that's what those, that's what those, their teachers taught. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Wow! Is that easy to do? Most of us would go, what? Right? What do you mean? Love them that hate us. I'm going to tell you, there are those who hate us. There are those who hate us. And in our natural reaction is to despise and to hate them too, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Isn't that natural? That's why he says, love your enemies. Love your enemies. Bless them. That curse you. They've been cursed at. Bless them that curse you. Make them happy that hate you, that curse you. Right? Do good to them that hate you. They throw their doggy doos in your yard. What do you want to do? You want to scoop up those do doggy do and, and a few other things too and put it on their front porch, don't you? I mean, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, retaliation. Isn't that what we want to do? Now, how many of you are going to go out there and, and cut flowers out of your beautiful garden and take over to your neighbor? After they just keep doggy pooing you up. <laughs> well, I, that's that's where we live, isn't it? Let's get down to where we live. Let's let's deal with the truth of it. Our, our, our we 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 want to build a bigger fence so they can't get it over the over the top of the fence. That's not what it says. It says pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. So when not so when they when your neighbor does that. Not only do you cut, take, cut flowers from your garden and go give it to them, you also get down on your knees in your bedroom and you pray for them. Mm -hmm. Why? Verse 45. That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh the sun to rise on the evil and on the good and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love them which love you, what reward have you? Do not even the publicans the same? Listen, the publicans were the most despised among the Jewish people. Because it's almost like they, they would work for the Romans to collect taxes from their own people. And the Jewish people hated the publicans. But you know what? The publicans loved each other. They did, because that was their only friends. Just, he says, if you love them, they love you. What reward have you? We just love the people in our church. We love those who love the Lord. If that's it, what reward? What are we doing that, that even the heathen don't? If the heathen do the same thing, what makes us any different? What makes us different is when we pray for them, when we do good to them. So that if you salute your brethren only, what do you more than others? Do not even the public and so? Be therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven. Perfect. So we are marked out as the children of our Heavenly Father when we go and do these things, when we love our enemy, when we bless them that curse us, when we do good to them that hate you and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. We show that we belong to God. That's pretty important. That's pretty important. That's, 
That makes us not like everybody else, does it? Because nobody else is going to do that. Over in Proverbs chapter 25, listen to what it says in Proverbs 25, verse 21 and 22. It says, If an enemy be hungry, give him bread to eat. <laughs> Wouldn't you rather have him starve? He's your enemy. Maybe if he starved long enough, he'd go home and leave you alone. This is if I enemy hunger, give him bread to eat. If he be thirsty, give him water to drink. For thou shalt eat coals of fire upon his head, and the Lord shall reward thee. Now understand there that some people think that uh, heaping coals of fire is like putting judgment on him. No. What it means is you take the coals off of your fire and you put it in a bucket, and they generally would carry things on top of their head, and they would carry it home on their head, and then so they could make a fire at home so they could make their own bread. Give them fire from your fireplace so that they can have warmth, so that they can cook their food. And not only that, fire isn't the fire a place of great comfort. Fire is comforting. When you're sitting next to a fireplace, don't you find that as a comforting place? It's like comfort food. <laughs> we eat it because it makes us feel good. Fire makes you feel good. And we are to give them fire to take home so that they can keep themselves warm and be comfortable. You feed them. You give them water and you give them fire and you give them comfort. And there you're in. Now, I didn't say that you have no argument with me. You have an argument with God if you don't agree with that. Take it up with him, and he'll teach you. <laughs> you may teach it the hard way, but he will teach you. Then it says, lastly, supply charity. In First John four twenty one says, and this is the commandment which, and this command we have in him that does not love God, love his brother also. Charity. If we love God, we're going to love one another. And that love is demonstrated, isn't it? We demonstrate our love one to another. We show that we love one another. In First Peter chapter 3, in verse 8, back over there a little bit, First Peter chapter 3 and verse 8, it says, Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren. Be pitiful. Be courteous. We're to be the, the word there, pitiful, means tender-hearted, compassionate. Finally, be all one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brethren. Be 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 considered. Be be tender-hearted. Be pitiful. Be courteous. Not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise, just the opposite of that. Blessing, knowing that they knowing that they are thereunto called that ye should inherit a blessing. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from speaking evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Careful about what you say. We sing that little kid song, be careful little hands what you do. Is it one of those courses, be careful little mouth what you say? So we are to be careful about what we say. Refrain our tongue. It says, let us eschew. That means uh, shun evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. You go after it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. So we are to love the brethren. Blessing and prayer. The word of being courteous and kind. Those are natural things that come out of charity, aren't they? Sometimes we're not very charitable, are we? We aren't careful and guard so much what we say. And shame on us because we don't. And we ought to. I mean, really, shame on us. And when we are made aware of it, we ought to confess it, right? Chari in 1 Corinthians 13 says, Chari Chari Charity suffereth long and is kind. It envieth not. It isn't jealous of your brother or anything. It vaunteth not itself. It doesn't. It's not puffed up. It's not lifted. It's not elevated. It doesn't put your. You don't put yourself over another. It doesn't. It doesn't behave itself unseemly. That means inappropriately. 
seeketh not her own. It's not self-serving, not easily provoked. Charity doesn't provoke you. It doesn't cause us to be provoked by the actions of somebody else. No, thinketh no evil. Oh my, our thought lives, aren't we glad that nobody else knows what we think? I'll tell you what, sometimes we're, we ought to be ashamed of the things that we think. Sometimes we are ashamed of the things we think, right? Mm-hmm. We ought to be. We ought to confess them. It rejoiceth not in iniquity. In other words, it hates that which is which is sinful, but rejoices in the truth, loves the truth. It beareth all things and believeth all things and hopeth all things that are to be born and believed and hoped for and endure all things. Those things that are, which are godly and, and, and things that concern Christ. Charity never fails. Love never fails. It never, ever fails. It will always accomplish what needs to be accomplished if we exercise charity. Now, by the faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. Now, we're going to try and sum up the conclusion here real quick. There are wonderful benefits that come to us when we practice our Christianity and supply to our faith these seven virtues. There are wonderful, wonderful blessings that are listed here. First of all, when we go over to Second Peter there, chapter 1, we can get back to my text here. It says, If these things be in you and abound, that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Be, be the, we will always be fruitful in the knowledge of Christ if we do, if we supply these things to our faith. The word there, barren, means useless. It means unemployed. It means idle. You take a field that's not being used for the production of food for a harvest. It's idle. It's sitting there doing nothing. And I'll tell you what, when we don't supply to our faith these virtues, we are likely barren unfruitful like the fig tree that was full of leaves but had no fruit on it. In Matthew 13, 23 says, but he, but he that received seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth some a hundred fold, some sixty, and some thirty. So we see that the sower goes out and seed, it sows the seed into the field and the good ground prepared ground to receive the seed, receives it. He hears the word and understands. Now, this, my, our afternoon Bible study might get to that point in our text about understanding the word. The understanding is not natural. It's spiritual. God causes us to understand the word. Amen. And when he does that, as a result, there is fruit that is grown. In John 15, 16, says, I Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit fruit should remain that whatsoever you shall ask in my Father's name he may give to you. So we'll be fruitful when we add these things to us. And we're fruitful where? In the knowledge of Christ. That's what this is all about. This is what all of this is about. Just learning more about Christ. Becoming more Christ-like and having the mind of Christ in all things. We gain an experimental in, uh, knowledge of Christ. That is, our day-to-day living, we manifest that we are the children of God. Every day, we do good. We preach the kingdom of God. We, we, uh, and we understand the necessity of repentance in our life. We understand the, the, the reforming that goes on pressed to us by the Holy Spirit in, in clearing out the sins that, that, those, that those so easily beset us. So we become knowledgeable in Christ. Then we shall not lack spiritual vision or insight because it says, He that lacketh these things in verse 9 is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sin. So we, we, we don't lack in spiritual vision and insight. We'll be able to see, won't we? I got corrective lenses on. I got these glasses. Tell you what, I cannot see afar off without my glasses. Matter of fact, I have a problem with seeing close in too. That's why these are 
progressive lenses, otherwise I'd be wearing trifocals so I could see close and see far away and see in between. Those who do not exercise these things in these seven things and minister to their faith lack the faculties to see great things that God has prepared for them in this life. They cannot see it. They're, they're, it would be like uh, only having sopranos in your choir. What kind of a choir do you have if you have only sopranos? And you have nothing else. You have no depth, do you? No broadness, no depth. There's a, the lack of depth or, uh, of spiritual knowledge is uh, and spiritual blindness. You, you don't see things. We talked about faith. And we define faith as, as spiritual eyes. Being able to see those things which are not visible. Being unseen, but we know them to be so, and we have the evidence of it. But those who who lack in this the spiritual uh, understanding, this vision, they're blind as to spiritual realities, and, and, and they show their faithlessness. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. They can't see. They don't see it. They're only on a horizontal level. They can't see it far off. They're nearsighted. Their only vision is in the things of this world, not in the world to come. They're very, very short-sighted. They don't look and see the things that God is doing or can do. They've been, they, they're blind. Now, it doesn't say here that they're unbelievers. It says they come up short-sighted because they have not exercised themselves in these spiritual things. They lose sight of the hope that is in Christ, our resurrection and future glory. The city whose builder and maker is God. They lose sight of that. They see, they look down and they see themselves in the world. This is a, and this, the, the other benefit, third benefit, is that we shall never forget our redemption. Look what it says there. It says, and hath, uh, it says, He that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see it far off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from old sin. He forgot them. Now the depth of depravity that we have, he'll forget the depravity that he's been lifted from. The forgiveness of our sins, the great redemption, Christ, justification, that great gospel blessing which makes us so we will, shall never be chargeable with uh, the crimes that we've committed against our Lord. We'll never be charged with him. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is Christ that justify it. That was that's Romans chapter eight, verse one, I believe. The word here forgotten that they were purged from their old sins. The word forgotten means contracted forgetfulness. Like the elderly. They know, they have knowledge. They they you know, and they're going through their life, but as we get older, sometimes we get brain fog. We get dementia. Or we get Alzheimer's, a, a plaque that builds up in the brain, and we forget. Do we not? We forget. We, it's, it's possible to forget your children, who they are. They're strange people to you. That's a terrible thing, isn't it? The word here for forgetfulness is like a contracted, they, they contracted this forgetfulness. And they, be, and they learn, or they begin to, to and, uh, without the exercise of this practical Christianity, they lose their assurance of redemption, and they become filled with selfishness and doubt, and, and they be, and they start to doubt the grace of God. They may become cynical in spiritual things, and, and, and uh, so there's great confusion because they did not take these wonderful virtues that God had given them and exercise them and become fruitful. The exercise of these virtues secures to us the knowledge of our election because it says here, wherefore rather the brethren give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. Listen folks, when we do this, when we bring these things in, we have great assurance that comes to us that when we practice these practical things of Christianity, constantly supplying our faith with these graces and gifts, it makes us gives us assurance of our calling and election. We're sure that we belong to God, that we are the children of God. How many people 
lack this wonderful assurance because they've not exercised in them to exercise these themselves in these virtues. For so an inheritance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, I thank you for today and I thank you for your kind word. And Father, I ask that, that today that we should find ourselves exercised in these virtues so that Christ might be a reality to us, that we'll be practical in our application of these scriptures and that we will be at great assurance of being the children of God. So Father, bless us now. Thank you for the, the food that's been so wonderfully provided for us. Maybe a sweet fellowship with one another in Jesus' name.